So you may or may not be aware that I've actually now graduated from Cardiff University. It's been four years. You may or may not know if you follow me on my other channels like TikTok or Instagram that I've actually completed the LLB law degree at Cardiff University with a placement year with honours. I don't even know how to put it into words because it's crazy. Four years has gone so fast. I did graduate with a 2 1 as well, and I'm really elated with that result. And since then, I have enrolled on to my SQE Providers course, which I'm, I've shared this already. I'm going with the College of Legal Practice. That's who my firm have chosen as our like course provider for the SQE. So I start the SQE and I start my training position on the 5th of August, which is very exciting, very exciting. So I thought, let me answer some of the questions that you guys had for me in terms of like, note taking, how did I find final year? Those kind of questions like, would I suggest anything? Would I do anything different? Is there any things that I wish I'd known before I like, went into final year, that kind of thing? I'm gonna run through some of the questions that you guys have sent me. Hopefully this answers some of your questions about final year, but if, you, if your questions didn't get answered, I'm going to post like another Q&A thing on my Instagram and I will share it to TikTok as well. Ask me any of the questions you want and we'll just go through it like that. But hopefully for now for this YouTube video, hopefully some of your questions get answered. Right, I've got the first question here. I'll put the question up on the screen as well. I'm going to be looking down at my notes on my laptop as well. So if my eyes are darting, that's literally why. So the first question is... I wanted to ask you about the family law module in third year. So this is specific to Cardiff University. Just wanted to know what kind of topics does it entail? What are the assessments like and who teaches it? Basically, the family law module at Cardiff University is 25% multiple choice questions, so MCTs, and then the other 75% of it is an essay question. That was one of my reasons for choosing it because I feel like I'm quite strong on multiple choice questions like that's just something that i'm quite good at i would say i also thought maybe it'll be helpful for when i'm doing the sqe if i can start now getting used to how mcts work i do think it's like helped me like because the mct exam even though it was 25 percent, there was so many questions and it was also in person and i have not done exams in person since gcse's because of COVID. So in my head, I was like, wow, MCTs, check for SQE, and also in person, check for SQE. And then the 75% is an essay question, which was done online and it was open book. So that's quite nice. In the first semester of the year, so that's, I'm gonna say like September, end of September to January. The exam was in January. From end of September to January, first semester, you, you cover three topics. So it's marriage, post-separation orders and then parenting and divorce and honestly I love those modules I'm not even gonna lie I love them those three topics are the ones that are covered in your MCT so those are the ones in the multiple choice question exams that you sit in January and honestly you only get questions on those three topics they're the scenario based questions but honestly when I tell you the way that they deliver the content the lectures is amazing and it really did help with the application to the questions and you do so many practice MCTs. So you do one in every seminar and then you also have them as part of like your lectures. So in, in your lectures, there are also MCTs that you can follow and they also give you like practice papers. So honestly, everyone I know did amazing on it. And then in semester two, so that's from February onwards, so February to, the our exams in May, so February to May. From February to May, you work on the next three topics. So as much as you can just put the other topics to the side, the ones for the semester one, they actually are quite useful in incorporating into semester two. But in semester two, you're actually only assessed on civil partnership, cohabitation, and then family law reform. But I think they all can be entangled, but you do get separate content for those three topics in the second semester. And then that's obviously the essay question, which is open book. 
and although you learn three topics in semester two you only have to choose one topic that you're going to write an essay question on because it's only one question you get asked and i think that's really good so if you really didn't like law reform or cohabitation then you can do it on civil partnership or if you didn't like civil partnership and family law reform you can just do it on cohabitation so it really means that you can focus all your research that you need to do for the essay on a specific topic and i think that really helps and then what i did say to the student was also that i did support through court i did it in my first year and i also did it in my second year what i would say that if you do get the chance if you do get the chance to do support through court honestly all the material everything that you're advising clients on at support through court is literally the family law module i went into the first few lectures and i was like oh my god i i know this and I was sat there like, oh my God, look at all these forms. I know how to fill out those forms. I do that for clients. And then like, obviously there was people in there that hadn't had a clue what some of these forms were. Obviously you like learn straight away, like there's lectures and so on. But in my head, I was like, wow, like I already know this. Like it's actually really great how I could hone my skills that I learned at support food court and then apply them to the module. So I, I was really grateful for that. And then I would say that the module leaders for family law were amazing, really supportive. You can build quite a good relationship with them because they also work on some of the other modules. So one of the module leaders I had for family law also was a module leader for equity interests. And I found that was so helpful because I got to see them quite a lot. And then I could ask them questions or well, on the discussion board, like I could, I could like read through their replies and yeah like it was it was really nice having like a module lead that was on two different modules i've also been asked did i prefer healthcare ethics and law or did i prefer family law which one would you recommend firstly i wouldn't recommend a module to any student because i think if you get the chance when they send you the module list make sure to read for it i said all universities send you a module list and it like details everything that you'll be learning i would definitely say read that i would say don't choose what other people are choosing don't follow don't be a sheep and make make that decision for yourself like obviously get people's opinions on like how they found the module and so on because honestly the amount of people that told me that they didn't like evidence so i was a bit like evidence is not a piece of me then i'm not going to be studying that <laughs> yeah get everyone's opinions and make that decision for yourself like i'm not going to recommend you any of the modules i've studied over the past four years because i think that's going to be your decision and you shouldn't be a sheep. What I would say is that healthcare ethics and law and family law are completely different modules. Like you can't really put them side by side, but obviously if you're choosing between them, I'd say firstly family law, you've got the 25% MCT and then you've also got the 75% online open book essay question, which is only on one topic. And then with healthcare ethics and law, I would say that it's a 100% open book online exam and then a mixture of problem questions and essays and you have to write three. And there's questions on like every topic, but they're all kind of like, as much as there's questions on every topic, they're all slightly intermingled. So they don't tell you what's going to be on the exam. Like it's very much like you've just got to think for yourself. Some people find that 100% open book online exam is not preferable for them. But what I would say is that I actually did like the 100% online open book exams. In family law, it put a lot of stress on you in January with the MCT. But again, like it wasn't like a difficult exam. That's how I felt. I really, really, really enjoyed the content for healthcare ethics and law. Like I really enjoyed the content. It was probably up there with some of my favourite modules. Like, I'm going to be a bit controversial now. I really do love land law. I know a lot of people are going to be like, what the hell? But I love land law. So, this year, we did an introduction to healthcare ethics and law. We did a capacity and consent to treatment, assisted conception, abortion, organ donation, end of life, and then advanced directives. My favourite topics were abortion. I really loved capacity and consent and then I also loved um, advanced directives. I've had another question that says how do I keep up with the latest news? For example what websites do I use because this student has an interview coming up 
and they'll be asking questions about the latest news and I want to make sure I'm up to date any suggestions on what I can do and then they've also heard from previous applicants they ask about cases that interests them or recent cases that they've followed and do I have any recommendations on cases that I could follow with this one personally have a subscription to Watson's Daily and if you don't know what that is it's almost like a commercial awareness like hub app which it, like basically he updates it every day and it comes up with like everything that's going on in like every day really find that helpful you can also pay for different like subscriptions so there's like silver gold bronze I find that super helpful but what I would do is I personally watch the news religiously so I have an iPad and as much as I do all my work on my laptop I have my iPad specifically for like note taking or like watching lectures or watching the news and what I do is I watch the news whilst I'm eating my breakfast or whilst I'm like sat here making notes so if you are one of those students that likes to prep your lecture notes before you go into the lecture so you like get all the content done so you can put your notes alongside it that's what i did anyway whilst i was typing out the lecture content i was watching the news on my ipad and i found that super helpful i do think that the news watching the news i know it sounds stupid and a bit simple but if you put on bbc news or sky news they're free apps on your phone your ipad your laptop and just watch them like put it on in the background I was one of those kids that grew up with parents that would have the news on in the morning or like Lorraine or and you'd be getting ready for school and you could just hear it in the background. I think personally that's where I got it from but just having the news on will really help you build like a wider sense of commercial awareness. I would also say that with applications and in terms of like following cases I personally didn't go into criminal law so I can't help with criminal cases but what I would say is for commercial law firms that deal with like that are very much like full service I would say if you evaluate the company's LinkedIn I know it sounds a bit stalkerish but if you go on LinkedIn type in the company's name <laughs> if you go on Google type in the company's name and see what they're posting but nine times out of ten what firms do is that they post what they're working on articles that their like own trainees or like solicitors have wrote about current law you can then talk about those cases in your interviews you can also build on it by saying if you know who's, who's going to be interviewing you you can then look well stalk them to see what they're specifically working on and this will help you because then you can like understand fully the case issues that you might like find with it and then like you can go into the interview and be like ah oh, so i know you're working on this case this is one of the cases i'm really interested in this is one of the cases i'm following and this is my thought on it how are you finding the case da, 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 da. and like it will spark like a better conversation because that's that's my mindset going into interviews is that they're very much conversation based and i think if you can make it more personal I think that'd be great also if you're gonna think of a case to bring to an interview make sure that you know that case and I don't mean this like I'm respectfully make sure you understand it because you can go into an interview you can say ah, oh, I've been following this case and you've only learned five bullet points about it and then they ask you something and you're like and that's a problem because you obviously aren't following it then you've just tried to memorize it for brownie points honestly if you are applying to firms you've got to live and breathe those firms you've actually got to want to go there which is why i feel like when i see people applying for 100 firms 200 firms and they've got like these massive spreadsheets as much as like that can work for some people i think having five to ten firms in an application cycle that you fully live and breathe and you know what's going on with them will really make a difference in terms of how you come across in your application and your interview the only criminal cases that I'm following personally at the moment are Innocence Project cases, mainly in the UK and the US. This is because I'm really interested in justice and the Innocence Project. I did work as a team leader and a caseworker for the Cardiff Innocence Project. So this is something that I've been working on three out of the four years that I've been at Cardiff University. Yeah, what I can say is definitely go to your Crown Court if you can and on some of the cases, if you are also interested in Innocence Project cases, 
I would say try and get involved if you're at Cardiff University or if you're not like try and get involved with like some of the organisations side of universities as well because I really do think that following those kind of cases are really helpful and personally those are what also interest me. Right someone's asked me what courses am I studying at university so currently I'm not at university anymore I've graduated but what I did study at Cardiff University in my final year was equity and trusts, EU law, the law of the European Union, healthcare ethics and law and family law. I did four 30 credit modules. Another student has asked me what laptop would I recommend? They've got an iPad at the moment but I feel like it's not amazing for law. I feel like university when you go into the lecture theatres they do look like an Apple ecosystem because everyone has got either a MacBook or an iPad of some sort but that is not completely true. There are also students that have got like ThinkPads or like Windows laptops and I think those all work great. I personally had a laptop for A-levels, I had a MacBook and it has lasted me and I still got it like it's still on, oh that nearly hit my face, this is still in perfect condition and I've had this since A-levels so yeah. I personally would recommend a MacBook because that's the only laptop I've used but since going into law firms and working vacation schemes and assessment centres, I would say that all their laptops are not necessarily all MacBooks. So some of them are the Windows laptops and ThinkPads. And that was an adjustment for me because all I'd known is a MacBook. And then going to those kind of laptops, it was a bit of a shift in terms of like, you know, muscle memory and just being able to type. I don't know, it's not that big of a problem, but honestly, I'd just be typing and I'd be like, oh, that's not a word. <laughs> I would recommend a MacBook, but I would also recommend the more study laptops. So my stepbrother does not believe in the Apple ecosystem at all. He's a big defender for like Windows and I definitely think those laptops can still last the four years. I would say, make sure you get a good laptop. It doesn't have to be expensive, but get one that's gonna last you the four years, or at least it's not gonna break down on you in the middle of an exam. I know that books are reliable which is why i invested in one i also did get an ipad so the student asked if an ipad is an amazing for law i wouldn't necessarily just use my ipad on its own i would have to use it in conjunction with my laptop i find that i need two screens especially when i'm watching lectures online i like having my lectures on my ipad and then being able to type on my laptop or if i'm going through my notes on my laptop I like to jot down stuff on my iPad like I wouldn't necessarily just want to use my iPad like, I, I do have a keyboard for my iPad and I find that useful in terms of if my laptop is dead I can just make all the notes on my iPad and if you can't afford a laptop I think an iPad is doable I would say if you are in the price point for an iPad what I would say is you can get portable monitors and I think they're about £50 on Amazon which is still quite pricey but a lot more affordable than an iPad, which is like £800 minimum, I think. So if you can get a portable monitor and then you can like plug it into your laptop, I think that's great. It still works with the two screens. So another student has asked me, am I open to looking at CVs and cover letters for vacation scheme applications or training contract applications? I am completely available to do that. If you want to send them to me via Instagram, email, I've got my email link down below or on LinkedIn, I will happily take a look for you, I'll give you a lot of feedback because that's one of the things that I wish someone had done for me is just give me loads of feedback at the start of my journey on my CV and cover letter. I had to learn that myself. So yes, I'm completely open to doing that. If you want to send them to me, email, Instagram, LinkedIn, any of those forms, just obviously title it, you know, your name and your cover letter and what you're applying for, if that makes sense just so I know roughly what you're applying for and what you're sort of going for. Another student has asked me, I'm starting at Cardiff University this week and I'm also studying law. I was wondering if you have a, any advice as they're a bit nervous, they've never studied law before, their commercial awareness isn't very good. Do you think that this will put them at a disadvantage? If you are starting a university this September to study law, and you've never studied law before, don't worry. I, I didn't study law before I got to Cardiff University either. I did, so somebody told me, so this is the big myth, right? Somebody told me you, you shouldn't study law at A-level because 
it doesn't look favorably on your application that's completely false like yeah i don't know who's i don't know who was spreading that rumor back when i was in college but you can do any modules you want to do at a level any at all as long as you get the grades and in your personal statement you really hone in on why you want to study law and why law is for you then i think in terms of picking which modules you want to do at a level i think universities are more concerned with ucas points and grades and then obviously your personal statement i wouldn't say that they're looking specifically for english or law in my personal opinion i don't think they care as much about the actual module i think they care more about the grades and then your personal statement so i don't think it's going to put you at disadvantage of never studying law before because i didn't and i've done perfectly okay in first year as well at cardiff university they do a module called legal foundations which is compulsory and that is basically what i've been told is like a level law summed up in one and like for me it was not a, like a tough module like you can get your head around it in in a year it's completely fine in terms of your commercial awareness isn't very good do you think this might put you at a disadvantage i personally don't think not having good commercial awareness at a level stage is a disadvantage what i would say is that people who are studying a levels have the opportunities to apply to, to get into law programs so you can start applying from a level stages to get into those big firms you can you can start go into the insight days the open days the year 12 schemes the year 13 schemes and then in first year you've got the first year schemes and which is this is why i always say first year grades are important in terms of like i wouldn't say slack off if you want to go to law firm a training contract a lot of the firms tend to want a 2-1 or a first that is why it's important to start focusing on your grades in first year because if you want to apply for if you want to get your foot in the door straight away first year schemes are where it's at, first year open days, etc, etc. And all those things to get into, you need a projected 2-1 first. In terms of your commercial awareness, that's completely easy to fix. You know, you can start joining the societies when you get to university. So at Cardiff, you know, we founded the Commercial Awareness Society. So you can join that. You've got the law societies at universities. You've got like the women in law societies at universities. You've got like so many different societies you've got un societies like all of those will help you build your commercial awareness i've also had another question from a student and i think this one's quite important because we've got level results day coming up soon and gcse results day i'm pretty sure in august i believe they're in august aren't they and someone's asked me what gcse grades do you need to achieve to do law at cardiff personally don't know if they looked at my gcse grades so I had looked at the official grade requirements on the Cardiff University website and they only ask for a B in English language and then they want either AAA at A level or AAB. They also take the EPQ into reflection so if you've got one of those that's amazing. I did get majority 9s, 8s and 7s for GCSEs which is equivalent because I know that like not everyone has numbers which is equivalent to a 9 is an A star star an eight is an A star and then a seven is an A. So I got majority equivalent to A star stars, A stars and A's. They go on to say that on the website that it says that you need to get at least a minimum B in maths GCSE and they're on a C. And personally, I got a six, which is equivalent to a B. What I've learned from being around so many law students is that a lot of law students aren't as strong in maths. You shouldn't worry at this stage. If you find out on results day that your grade is one below, I don't think you need to worry. If you've got extenuating circumstances, the university will take that into account. And I think with also clearing, most likely going to take you through clearing as well. I don't think you need to worry about your grades. I think you've all done amazingly. You've all probably done great. And I think there's no need to worry. Do you have any tips on getting a high 2-1? from EU and equity. I've actually just finished these two modules. What I would say with EU law is that I found it easier to do the content online. That was just because of like my style of learning. What I would say in achieving a high 2-1 in both of those modules, which I did, I did achieve like a high 2-1 degree overall. I would say these are five tips I have, is that you must really fully understand 
what you're going to be assessed on and what the assessment consists of. I can't stress it enough. You need to understand how the assessment is going to go and like what you're going to be assessed on and the content and so on and where you should focus your energy. The second tip is then to understand what readings that you should be doing. So read both the primary and the secondary sources. Do the recommended reading. As much as I felt like the like the necessary reading that was set was very repetitive to the lecture content, it kind of solidified my understanding of the content. And then from there, I really do think the way that you get the higher marks, which is probably why I did better in EU in terms of now looking back and like reflecting, is that a lot of my EU essays and so on were very based on my secondary further reading. So I did a lot of further reading for EU law and probably not as much for equity and trusts. And I think when you've got essays that really want you to develop your own thought process and really want you to like develop your own argument, I think the independent sources really help you build that. I personally created a source bank which had all my readings in, so both secondary and primary and then all of my required reading and then all of my further reading. And this really helped structure all the learning I was doing. By having this source bank, when I was in the exam, if I just clicked search and I searched for a word, like it would come up and then I could really look into what I had like actually found out in that source. And then I was able to apply that to the essay. The third thing then would be really develop a thorough understanding of each case on each topic. So I did case banks, like case tables for every single topic. So yeah, my storage is crying on my laptop, but what you need to do is make sure you've got the headings of case, name, reference, the area of the law, the summary of the case, the key facts, and then the outcome of the case, and then its relevancy and its impact. And I think when you're using those headings, it really helps then for you to fully understand the case, which is really important, but then being able to apply those cases. A lot of the problem questions in equity and trusts require you to really apply the cases. And this is the same for healthcare ethics and law with the problem questions is that you really do need to apply the cases to the specific content and a lot of the questions in the exam will be very specific to cases that you've come across or you should have come across because a lot of the time students don't really like have a thorough understanding of the case and then they don't include them. If you do your reading and if you do your research a lot of the cases you find will actually be so similar to the questions in the exam and that's where you get the high marks because you been able to apply it and justify your reasoning with a case like that's in the law and that that's really important thing with every formative that you do get feedback because one of the things that i found was really useful is that some of the formative exams slash some of the exams that i did in my spare time when i asked for feedback then i was able to see what content needed to be applied so a lot of the subjects actually did feedback like sheets so you were able to see exactly what you should have applied and the cases you should have applied and the content you should have applied and i think this is really important the content of the question might be a bit different in your summative you know that if that issue comes up you need to apply that certain fact or case or research and i think i think that's what's really going to help support and develop your argument is by drawing on your feedback. I think feedback is really important and if you don't get enough feedback make sure just to contact the module leaders. The fourth thing that I had down for getting a high two one slash first in your modules is that lecture notes are not the same as revision notes. So I personally did all my notes on OneNote. OneNote is an app that you can get on your laptop and you can separate out all the modules as books. Then you can go inside those books and then create like, the best way to describe it is you can then create like different sections in that book. So I did a section on every single topic and then within those sections, you can add pages. So it's almost like having online literal folders of each of your modules. And I found that so helpful because I was like, this is so organized. They can see everything. This is great. Going into a seminar, I would prep all my seminar content I'd get into the seminar, I'd create notes alongside the seminar content that I had made. And then when I went home, I would then consolidate it all into one document on a word. And then I'd also make topic summary notes for each topic. 
which were basically drafted from the lecture notes and the seminar consolidation notes. And then this was put into a document on Word, which was two sides of A4. And then when you save them to Word, again, you can use the search feature, which is very useful for exams. As much as I think lecture notes are really useful, I think that by, as I said, topic summary notes are very good at then consolidating your knowledge and making sure you thoroughly understand it. I think when you create lecture notes, you make them during the lecture and then you kind of draw off them for the seminar but then you kind of leave them and it's kind of like you've looked at them once in my head by doing the topic summary notes my brain is then able to get a refresh of all of the material and bring it all together into it like it's almost like a document that's supposed to have everything that i know on it but like consolidated and it was then a clear visual of all the key information, key cases, key readings. And I found these really useful. My final tip is that structure is very important. I think a lot of people forget that structure is actually one of the things on the rubric. So it's one of the things that you're actually being assessed on. So you might have all the content there. You might have all of the grammar and the punctuation and so on. But if your structure is not right, you're not getting up into the high marks. And I think that's where a lot of people fall short. Obviously, when you think of structure, you think of paragraphing, but that's not also the way. You've got to think of IRAC for problem questions, which is like issue, rule of law, application, conclusion. Then you've got to think about when you go into an essay question, you've got to have a clear introduction, conclusion. Make sure you're not introducing anything new in the conclusion and then a main body. And the main body I usually do is three sections, which is three different ideas. With the problem questions, if we're going back to IRAC, you've got to make sure that you have everything detailed so you need all the cases you need all the precedents you need to make sure that it's in a methodological way so that the reader and the examiner isn't getting confused by your train of thought it's got to be really well thought out and then with essay questions our university taught us to use bloom's taxonomy which i think really helps like i personally use i've used that for the whole four years of my degree i think those are just five quick tips on how i think that you can get like a high two one first in your degree overall and i hope that those help i'm actually going to stop the video there because i feel like we've actually gone through a few questions and i feel like if you've got any more questions we can obviously go through those in a separate video thank you so much for making it to the end of the video thank you for watching it's been nice catching up as well it's lashana williamson cardiff law student please leave a like and a comment